If you're a college football fan, you have probably already watched the Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix or you're about to watch it. We're joined now by one of the stars of that documentary, Billy Lucci from Texags, who the glow up of the old clips of you versus you in your office in that doc. I mean, you turned into like a, a, a country music singer songwriter before our very eyes. Like fine wine, Andy, as I like to say. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, nobody ever told me I looked like that. And I'm sure 10 years <laughs> from now, I'll look back at what I look like in that documentary and go, damn it, what was I doing? But I'll take that versus the other one. I have a, a really close friend of mine. And uh, I know the last time I sat down with you, I was at, actually at her wedding in, in Colorado. and she's also my stylist if, ah. you know, and i do i know right now i'm just basic but i do for, you know when i need her um she's great and she you know I, she's good enough that i drive to dallas every couple of weeks to go buy clothes and and so she was messing with me about it uh just how that that was pre ashley styling me and then that was after the fact and well, so you know, big shouts to Ashley. If you're in the DFW area right. and you need, you need styling, that's, that's where you go. No so let, let's, you. let's talk about this documentary because I was shocked. Now you've always been an open book. You, you always tell great stories, but I was shocked Back at how at open you. Johnny was uncle Nate was Eric Burkhart, the agent who wound up firing Johnny. Like they just open book on this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would have told you that Nate would have been good. I would have told you that Johnny, uh, when he wants to open up, there are a few people that will tell a story like Johnny. And, and, and he's just got so many of them that, they're, that are real. You know, like he did more and he's done more in the last 10 years than, you know, in terms of like salacious, just jaw drop, your jaw drops on a story than probably most people, you know, 10 people added up in a lifetime would do. Um, Burkhart surprised me and pleasant surprise made me laugh. I've always loved EB. I've known him since, you know, he was kind of first getting into the game. I, I sat there and felt for him when he was dealing with <laughs> the circus that was Johnny. Um, and I thought he did a good job of kind of putting that into words in the doc and, and yeah, he had a glow up too, by the way, you see from when he was at tech with cliff and, and then, uh, <laughs> Now they're with, you know, Rock Nation and Jay-Z, and he's got that jacket on. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let, if I was country singer, you know, Burkhart was like some, you know, pop guy. Going oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's a pop star. But the, yep. so you had told me the story of Johnny's private workout with the Browns years ago. And to he hear that fleshed out by Burkhart, because you you lived it from the the <laughs> the, the state of – getting those frantic calls from Johnny in the middle of the night, like there it's spring break. There's no receivers here. I don't have cleats, all of that. And then hearing Burkhart talk about catching passes yeah. in a private workout for an NFL team. And that NFL team still drafted his guy that, in the first round. That's the deal. And, and I saw what they were doing. So they had to cut my, my, I had the punchline to bring it all together, which was, yeah, and they still drafted him in classic Cleveland Browns fashion. And that, in a nutshell, if you say, well, what happened in Cleveland? And go, this guy at that time in his life got drafted by that franchise. Boom. Just like everyone feared. You know, I was hoping against hope. But the Cleveland Browns in, in that state, and hell, I don't know, maybe their current state, and and – and Johnny Manziel in his state in 2013. And it was a match that never should have happened just based off of that, that workout. And I don't know how much of it got glossed over. And I think he was told me the other day, he was like, I wish he was like, I want to tell that version of the story because they were on the lake in Austin and they were supposed to, they were told you can't leave Austin after two 30. So coming from Austin to college station, PM. 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 Okay. Yeah, have like some lead time that probably meant he was meeting with them no later than six, if not five. And the Browns flew in. They were at a nice country club, private room dinner or, or an early dinner. And 
He said they were on the lake and looked at the, the phone and it was 4.30. Oh, and so they had to basically wrangle and scramble like you and I would do to get an Uber and get a private jet because that hour and 45 minute drive, hour and a half drive could not take an hour and a half. It Wait, would, they took a private jet from Austin to College Station. With all their buddies that had the jet. 80 miles all apart? Like a bunch of oil and gas buddies from West Texas that, that, that I think what? they were on the lake with. They flew it to College Station, so it would only take, you know, 15, 20 minutes versus an hour and a half. <laughs> and so he goes to the dinner with the Browns. And then when I – so calls me like three, four times. It's a Friday night. It's Easter weekend. No one's in town. I'm like, I'm, I'm in bed watching TV, and they're wrapping up dinner. And I don't answer, I don't answer, I don't answer. Then he calls – or a girl calls that was at the dinner with him. I answer. And it's him on the other line. He's like, why won't you? And I'm like, oh, God. And then I realize what's going on. I go, okay, I'm going to go over there. Little do I know Burkhart is there. Uh, you know, and, and we from there, we tried to kind of make sure everything went through. And that's when about one in the morning, you know, I'm we're in a, a big suite and I'm sleeping in on the couch. He comes out of the room and goes, hey, you know, we need to call. It was the A and M equipment manager. I said, uh -huh. one a.m., dude, on on Easter weekend. Like, I don't have we don't have footballs. I don't have shorts. I, I just have these, and they were like these. Like I don't even know what he was wearing. I was like, I don't, I don't have shorts. I don't have cleats. Luckily, you know the equipment manager, the assistant equipment manager. I should give him a shout out. Brandon Moreau drove, left his. Woke up in the middle of the night, left his wife and kids, drove over there, laid all the stuff out for him for this like 7 a.m. Saturday morning workout. And then they get there and, oh, by the way, there's no receivers. Oh, my God. Well, those, yeah, and they not. still drafted him. You just encapsulated the Cleveland Browns. If you saw the I, – I didn't, I didn't get to see it. If you saw it, pictured those three, Burkhart, his lawyer, Brad, and, and his manager, Gareth, who's, you know, at the time – Barely older than Johnny. He just got done at TCU. He's probably like 20. 20. It's the first time somebody named Gareth has ever caught passes for NFL scouts. Gareth, Brad, and Eric. Can y'all go out there and catch passes for into this pro day workout? And uh, I think they were just doing like the tops of the routes, you know, and they were just yeah, running yeah. 10 feet and catching them. And, you know, and it was like the swing passes to the backs. And Johnny said he killed it. And like I said in the documentary, <laughs> I called. I think it was maybe Eric, maybe it was Brad. I called one of them and said, how'd it go? And they said, you know, uh, it was a shit show. It was awful. And, and they, Johnny's just on his way back to the lake. I killed it. And uh, they said that. And I'm like, well, the Browns won't draft him. And who knows? Maybe they would have drafted him with the ninth pick. Instead of but, they, and, but remember, they traded up to 22 to get him that that just blows my mind when you, when hey, you think about andy the thing that people i and i i don't know how documented it is it might be i might be saying something everybody knows but you know there was a team at the time good team they weren't great and and, and they had a really good veteran quarterback he wasn't probably a top 10 but he was really good by the name of alex smith coached mm -hmm. by andy reed <laughs> Three Chiefs, oh and by all accounts, uh -huh. and you could ask EB that, and on down. I'm, I, I, we talked about. I guess it, it didn't make the doc, but you know, Eric Burkhart or not, Andy Reid and the Chiefs were. I think they were picking next. If they weren't, it was like two picks. From now, would they have pulled the trigger? I don't know. But by every account, they were going to draft him in that spot. So the Kansas City Chiefs would have drafted Johnny. Allegedly, and it's on enough authority that I do believe that was the case. And, and I know the Chiefs came. They, they still would have drafted Mahomes because he would have flamed out by that point. But true. But they did. They also came back a second time, I think, for Johnny, uh, and were interested. And maybe that would have kept him from draft. I don't know. But you laugh and you go, okay, the Pat Mahomes thing. There's some tie-ins to Johnny there, and one of them was that. But the other one is this, like. And I, I say timing, it was everything with Johnny. The timing at AM, you were there for it. Uh, Cliff, 
uh, and you're the one that said Johnny was a witch at the time when I was doing the doc. I didn't yeah, know. I made the documentary. I, I was shocked when I at saw the time. That. I didn't know if I could drop names or anything. And I'm like, I don't want to throw staples into it, you know. And and then as I watch it the other night, it's like, why did I give? But that was your quote. Was yeah. I look at you and you go, what did he say to you? And I told I told him what you what happened. You go, that dude's a damn witch. But it the timing of AM couldn't have been more perfect. Aggies were desperate to win. I, I went into it too. They they were leaving the SEC. It was or the Big Twelve it was this hundred year decision. They were breaking away from Texas for all the money they were spending and the limb they were going out on. The last thing they wanted to do was be a laughing stock. You knew that. We we talked about it a lot with you in our SEC Ready documentary. There was so much pressure, and here's this guy Johnny Menzel. The timing was perfect for A and M. That offense was perfect for the SEC at that time. He was the perfect trigger man. Kingsbury was the perfect play caller, the perfect guy for Johnny. Sumlin had that swagger. It was, it was the only way it could have worked for Johnny and a and and Sumlin and Cliff and everyone else. The timing couldn't have been worse. Think about them. how much money got made right, when you said How much money got made by other people? a and in terms of donations. Mm -hmm. Kevin Sumlin, Cliff Kingsbury, who got his first head coaching job out of it, that, that he then parlayed into an NFL head coaching job. Yep. I mean, it is, it's crazy what kind of revenue generator Johnny was in those two years. I mean, I would say, you know, more so than Cam Newton, more so than Tim T. But, you know, like everybody argues who's the, you know, Joe Burrow. Yeah, Burrow, yeah, but you know, like those guys had better endings to the, you know, they won national titles. Cam Newton's one year was incredible. Burrow's one year might have been the best. But their um, schools but, didn't need that thing to happen right then, and AM yeah. did. Yeah, and 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 just the money, it would go Johnny and everybody else. When you talk about money generated, and, and it was, it was just this. It, it was really just this explosion that no one expected i don't yeah, obviously he didn't expect it a and m didn't expect it i did get one person text me i thought a and m was painted in a bad light and no one else really felt that way but their thing was we put up the guardrails billy you knew what the guardrails were and my thought is this yes it was 70 minutes they could have gone into the whole a and m side of it and and, and it would have sounded i didn't think a and m came out sounding bad at all i think it was understood that like hey could everyone have done better could johnny could you know paul sumlin cliff the machine um even me as a friend is there some way i could have, i don't know we all could have everyone the whole thing you know is like you looked up and he was out the door and it was like man that was fun and then you go uh-oh yeah you know like well, uh -oh. and, 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 I, and i've lived that for the last 10 years like you know, and that's why we've remained so close. It's like, you know, I, that dude is like, you know, this He's like a little brother to me. Um, but my thing is the guardrails, sure, they were put up. And if people were in charge of guardrails and they didn't and the guardrails didn't work, then there's blame to be shared there, too. But everyone try. I will say, like, it, it all the people involved on the A&M side, they they I do believe they tried their best. And I think when you watch the documentary, you get a. Get, I think it's not like an ant. I don't think anything about it was anti A and M at all. I think you get this vibe of like, man, that must have been incredibly challenging for yes. everyone, but no one more so. And he did self sabotage. I mean, Johnny takes the he, he. I think he takes more of the blame even than he should, but he did. You know, if it would have been just not a personality like Johnny, none of that would have happened, and it would have been more like the storyline would have been, man, that guy, too bad he wasn't there for NIL, and it would have been as simple as that, right? Yeah. Well, the thing for – I believe Johnny says this in the doc. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he says basically it would not have mattered which NFL team drafted him. He was not ready to be an NFL quarterback at that time. Yeah. And I, I agree with that because you you look at where how he came out and the way he he operated at Texas A&M was fine for that that moment, but would never work in the NFL. Like no no quarterback will ever succeed in the NFL handling it that way. You know, and it, the, everyone asks, oh, man, what about NIL? What about it? I think the biggest thing about NIL with Johnny Manziel is he would have stayed one more year. 
A and M would have true. paid him God knows what. Might have been. Might have been more. Year. He might have been able to make as much as he'd make as a first round draft pick. And he might have. Yeah, and it, I, you're probably right. And he might have said, you know what, four losses this year. We went out losing to you know LSU and and oh, I, game I didn't play. I didn't play the way you know. Like he could have been a fully. Had to have one more year and go, this is my last shot. I want to be like a number one pick or the first quarterback picked, or I want to, you know, get millions upon million. You know, you know, I want to sign, you know, all those things I think could have been like a care or it could have just been more of the same. We'll yeah. never know, but it, it would have, I think, given him a chance. And I think he would have gone down as quite possibly like the best college football player ever if he would have because remember all that stuff that year andy all of it the ncaa yeah in the nil era none of that happens like he was a top five heisman finalist the 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 business he and uncle nate were running is perfectly allowed now right it's crazy and you 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 could you could do that with no problems yeah and with all that drama and all that partying and the craziness and the distraction and he was a heisman finalist and I think against Bama and Auburn, who played for the title that year, I think he had like nine, I think definitely over 800, if not closer to 900 yards of offense and about seven or eight touchdowns. I mean, yeah. it's. Well, I, was, cool. I was at that Bama game, you know, where, where Mike yep. Evans was, was just going off. And it, My. another year would have been really interesting. Him, him in college in 2014. Because remember, that's when Alabama started Blake Sims at quarterback. Uh, Auburn and Ole Miss and Mississippi State were really, really good. That would have been a crazy SEC West, if you think yeah. about it. It would have. And so, I, you know, it would have. And then the other thing is he probably wouldn't have got drafted by the Browns. We'd give him a little mm-hmm. more shot. I always thought Johnny needed to go to a team, the Saints, with Sean Brady Payton. and Sean Payton. The Patriots with Brady and Belichick. The 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 Chiefs with Alex Smith and and Andy Reid somewhere where he knew he wasn't going to play, but also a real franchise and organization where he just felt this real desire that I don't want to disappoint this head coach. I can't sit in a meeting room with Drew Brees and Tom Brady. Like I can't not work in front of these guys. I can't come in here hung like because he is. He is like that. If he would have been in the right situation, even I think at that age, not to say it would have worked, but it would have been a million times better. My other point, though, you look at the league now. Um, you look over there, at, you know, who won the Super Bowl two years ago with the Los Angeles Rams as a head coach. Um, you look McVay. at McVay, you look at Cliff Kingsbury as a head coach in the NFL, or he was. Um, Patrick Mahomes and the way he plays. Baker Mayfield, Johnny. Wilson out of BYU, I believe, said he, you know, grew up watching him. These guys, Mahomes, Kyler. Maybe, and maybe Peyton, not the best set of examples except for Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> this, is true. this is true. But Kyler's been to Pro Bowls. Baker's, yes. you know, won playoff games. My point is, you're so right, though. But my point is the style of play in quarterbacks and coaches. Is where the default is moving to in the NFL. Yeah, and it came yeah. right after him. Not to say that. You know, he would have had to have been clean and committed. You're right. No yeah. quarterback. Will ever- I, I'm just not sure. Like, it, it's interesting hearing, yeah. like, from his sister, who always seemed to be kind of a very level-headed she person is. in his life. When she says, even now, I don't know if he's going to be able to ever live a normal life. Like, that part made me very sad to hear. Mm. I, but it also makes me wonder if it ever would have worked out as a football player. Maybe just yeah, he wasn't destined to be a, a good NFL player. There's too much that goes into the, the, the preparation. And it did. Like he said in the doc, it came easy to him, college football, which very few people can ever say that to achieve that level of success to say, it came easy to me. He was as talented as anyone I've seen, you know, come out of Texas. The The – Adrian Peterson's, the Roy Williams, the Vince Young's, and, and that's, you know, that's at the very top of the list. You know, Des Bryant, there's so many, I, I don't even know where to begin. You've got so many NFL quarterbacks, you know, Matt Stafford, Drew Brees, Nick Foles, I'm naming, you know, yeah, <laughs> Super Bowl quarterbacks here. 
uh, Jalen Hurts. I just named like four Super Bowl. But Johnny, from a football talent, he doesn't have the arm. He doesn't throw like Matt Stat. You know, there, I, you go up and down. But from a football talent, that dude was there with like Peterson and Vince. And, but he, you know, he was under six foot. He wasn't built for it like some of those guys we mentioned were. But more than anything, you know, yeah, you look at all those guys I named and the majority of them have famous, famous work ethics, you know. Uh, yeah. and, and look, we mentioned Kyler Murray earlier. That would be one of the guys who I would put up there right alongside Johnny and Vince. Maybe even better. Kyler, Maybe Kyler better. may be the Never most lost. athletically gifted of all of these people. Never lost. And, and, yep. and that skill set and that – and he did. He did pattern a lot after Johnny and watched him and came to AM after him and uh, talked to Johnny, I think, on the day he committed. and so, But, again, people are questioning they're in Arizona, the work ethic and things like that, and it's just, you know. And, and I think with Johnny and Kyler, guys like that, when, when you're giving up something, in, in Kyler's case, it's pretty much simply size, kind of the same with Johnny. You have to make up for it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make up for it somehow. And, and I know in Johnny's case, he wasn't ready to – put in what it would have taken to make up for it. So how do you, how do you think Johnny feels post doc? And uh, now, now that everybody's seen, and it feels like he was pretty open. How did he feel about it, about the documentary? He feels, we talked, he feels great. He was really, he was really, I think he was really worried how it was going to come out and he didn't watch it until very recently. Like I think he, at one point he had asked me if I'd seen it before. I said, no, I mean, have you? He said, no. I said, what? You know, and, he was, I think he was just worried what, how it was going to come out from other people's sides. Cause he didn't bother to find out what anybody else said. He didn't go around asking. So he didn't know what Aaron or or Nate, said or what uncle Nate said or any of that. He never, we never asked me anything. He didn't ask me, you know, it's one thing to say, Hey, did you say anything crazy? It's going to make me look, but I'm like, he didn't say any of that. He didn't ask me, what did they ask you? He had no interest. He just, he knew he sat down with him. He knew what he said. He was comfortable with that. But I think he knew that he kind of, you know, bared his soul a little bit. And so I think he was like, I wonder how that's going to be received. I don't think he felt like he was going to go out there and burn anybody. He wasn't worried about that. I think he was more like, how am I going to be received, which all of us would be that way. And, and then I think he was kind of like, man, I don't know what everybody else will say, you know, in terms of, he didn't want to make a &M look bad. He didn't want to make his family look bad or himself, you know, or himself. He didn't really care about. Yeah, it didn't seem he cared about uh, making himself look bad. You, he did he a few did. times. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't. And, and, and that was, I think what he was like, man, I wonder how I'm going to be perceived, you know, just like you or I, or anyone would be, if you just said, Hey, I'm just going to sit in front of a camera and tell all to the world, um, good, bad, and the ugly. But afterwards, you know, I think he's really, I think for the first time, Andy, in a long time, I think there's like, a, and I hope he can capitalize on it, there's like a positive momentum to him. And there's always been popularity and there's always been intrigue and interest. But I think now there's like a positive momentum to him and his, and his brand. And I know he didn't, you know, he, like you said, sometimes he said things that made him come off bad and he knew it. You know, he was like, yeah, yeah, this is what it was. But I think when you that thing ends, like I think he realizes he's got support. The needle is, you know, all the way on tilt again. And people understand him, I think, a little more. And now he if he, you know, if he does the right things from a business standpoint and it makes the right moves, I think he could really capitalize on it. And I've got a multiple Multiple ways I think he should. And I think number one of them is to go speak. You know, I see AM and Alabama and Clemson, Ohio State, everybody pays these guests, Rice, you know, yep, yep. whoever. They pay these speakers to come in and talk to the kids. Who better to have an impact than a, and, and unfortunately, if this would have been out three months ago, you've seen his Heisman speech. Yep. You saw him on the dock. You know, kids in those things, they pull their hoodies on after practice and they're doing this half the time. Yeah. And for Johnny to go in there and say, hey, that's that was me. They'd and be I paying attention. For I sure. didn't listen to Chris Heron or what, what, what was his name? The, the yeah, Chris Heron is the, yeah, he, he came I in and did all those. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't listen to Chris Heron when he told me how he was 
on the street corner buying drugs before Celtics games. I didn't listen to that. I was looking at my phone. I was worried about whatever girl I was dating at the time. And, and now I was where you are then and I'm where I am now. So hear me out. You know, like who can have a more powerful message? I think in 2023 or even next summer, 2024 to kids yeah. that are in college football than Johnny football. And especially in the wake of this doc. And you know how much those guys are paid that are good. Yeah. And then you go into the whole other one where you speak to, you know, at corporate events. So you just go, go do two speeches and he would kill him and then do that. And man, I mean, that's just, that's just one of about a hundred little side things. I think he could do. I think he could do TV like, you know, at a, at a desk, I think. So anyway, he just needs to be in a place where he just commits and says, okay, let's do this. I think yeah. Time for him. Got to gotta show up. That's that's the only thing. So that is that is. So, Billy Lucci, you showed up. The Netflix famous Billy Lucci from Tex Ags. <sighs> Thanks so much. I feel disappointed I didn't say. And and the one and only Andy Staples turns to me <laughs> and says, "I I I am okay with it because I knew it was me." <laughs>